bad weather at the Kennedy Space Center uh, a couple of weeks ago. So then when it finally landed at Edwards Air Force Base in California and was brought back aboard a 747, Challenger had been sitting on the launch pad for quite some time. Originally scheduled on the 22nd, there have been five postponements of this mission. Uh, the record was Columbia with seven. There uh, were three weather postponements. Yesterday, we saw problems not only with the weather, but with the mechanical aspects. The handle on the outside of the entry hatch that leads into the shuttle evidently stripped a screw. This was noticed after they found that the micro switches were not closing properly on the shuttle, on the doorway, and they were getting some sensors in the inside of the cabin that they were not closing properly. Then they discovered that the handle, which is taken off in before flight, had the screw strip. They then sent away for a drill to take that screw out so they could go ahead and continue with the countdown. At that point, they were still planning on going. When the drill arrived, it had a dead battery in it. They had to send away again. They were delayed nearly by two hours, this all occurring at a time when the weather was uh, okay for the launch. Finally, they had to cut the bolt off, the titanium bolt, which is super hard, with a hacksaw. After they cut the bolt off, they removed the handle, went ahead and put the thermal protection into place. But after waiting for nearly two hours through good weather, bad weather once again moved into the launch area and the winds at the runway where they would have returned had there been a problem then were in excess of 30 miles an hour these are not acceptable to nasa flight rules so they decided to scrub again for today there was some concern yesterday about the temperatures falling in florida they reported that it was snowing yesterday in jacksonville for about eight minutes, so there was some concern about the cold temperatures. They monitored it into last night. They decided that they could go ahead and fill the uh, external tank with uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and that tanking took place about an hour late, an hour behind schedule, because there were some problems with the fire suppression equipment on the pad. They were uh, evidently not acclimating to the cold weather. By then, the temperature was below freezing. This morning, 24 degrees on the launch pad. They continued the count, got into this morning, decided to move it back because of those problems with the fire suppression, moved it back one hour from 9.37 to 10.37, and uh, at that point, they decided to uh, move it back another hour when they noticed that there was some ice on some of the remote service structures surrounding the, that, uh, the space shuttle. They went, set a team of eight men up who worked for about a half an hour knocking those two-foot-long icicles off. NASA had an emergency meeting to decide if they would go ahead with the count. The decision was made at that point to go ahead with the count. They went down and launched Challenger, and a minute into flight, it exploded. Lou? All right, Tom. On the line now, Frank Salter at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Frank, what are you hearing there? Lou, there are more questions than there are answers right now. Nobody really knows for certain exactly what happened. Uh, word from mission control that we have had so far was that about a minute 15 into the flight, all telemetry stops at about the same time as when you saw the fireball that became uh, the challenger. Basically, the reaction here has been one of stunned uh, silence. Uh, there are about 20 people in the public affairs office, mostly NASA contractors, Frank Seltzer, we'll be getting back to you at the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, the nerve center of the uh, space flight program. Now to Mary Alice Williams in New York. You know, the manned space pl flight program had finally reached a new goal. The test pilots who led the way had opened the way for civilians, just people who could learn and teach us and our children about the miracle and necessity of space exploration. What better choice than a teacher? It was supposed to be the ultimate field trip, 
third graders from Krista McAuliffe's Concord, New Hampshire hometown bound for Cape Canaveral and the blast off of a spaceship. Well, I think it's really neat because she's going to be the first private citizen in space. It's going to be very exciting watching it go off. I'm used to seeing um, Mrs. McAuliffe like um, out raking her yard or something, not floating around in space. Expectations also ran high in New Jersey as a gifted group of science students prepared to simulate the shuttle launch. Ever optimistic, the interrupted countdown of America's 25th shuttle expedition would finally be a go. Now school officials prepare to grapple with NASA's worst nightmare. Once they had seen the evidence on the visual screen that there would be no survivors, it suddenly became apparent to them that they were dealing with death. From a Soviet official in Washington, condolences and expressions of sympathy for the crew members' families. We regret loss of uh, lives of the crew, and uh, we express uh, deep sympathy to the uh, relatives and uh, friends of the perished astronauts. In New York, producers and the studio crew of a Sesame Street program watched in horror as the spacecraft blew apart. Uh, because it's never happened before, I think possibly many people even involved. The shocking spectacle was also seen in a city bar. It's one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen in my lifetime. I can't remember ever seeing anything like that, especially not with, with a, uh, a NASA-related uh, expedition. I'm appalled at it. So I feel very bad for the families of those involved. In a moment of mourning, one New Yorker paused to put the nation's loss into perspective. It's just terrible pity, it really is. But again, it shouldn't, shouldn't stop our program because we've got to keep going. It's doing so much for us in other areas. We continue our live coverage of this national loss with Bernie Shaw in Washington. Thank you, Mary Alice. This tragedy involving Challenger has affected the highest office in our land. President Reagan has decided to call off his planned State of the Union message to Congress of the nation tonight. White House spokesman Larry Speaks made the announcement less than an hour ago. To the tragedy of Space Shuttle Mission 51L, the President, in consultation with the leadership of Congress, has decided to postpone the State of the Union address that was scheduled for this evening. He will address the Congress and the American people on next Tuesday. First Lady Nancy Reagan is said to be in a state of shock and great grief for the families of the shuttle astronauts, according to her spokeswoman, Elaine Crispin, who says Mrs. Reagan was at the White House watching live television when the shuttle exploded. Mrs. Reagan said, oh my God, no, when she realized what had happened. The House of Representatives was preparing to go into session when it heard about the tragedy. House Chaplain James Ford quickly offered a special prayer for the victims. And at this special moment, let us remember in silent prayer those who were involved in the spacecraft shuttle accident just a few minutes ago off Florida. Let us pray. May your spirit, O oh Lord, be with them and may your love follow them and their families this day and every day, we pray. Amen. Reaction on Capitol Hill to the shuttle tragedy was strong and quick. With hearts uh, heavy in trauma and deeply felt sorrow, the nation today pays honor and tribute to these brave young Americans and extends its hand to their families, their loved ones, their comrades in such small ways as we can. We've come to accept these flights as being so routine and yet it's so highly sophisticated, highly so technological in nature that any little thing can go wrong. Remind me again of how mysteriously or God moves in mysterious ways. I guess from time to time to remind us of what mortal beings we really are. Joining us now is Marcia Smith. She's with the National Commission on Space. In fact, she is the executive director. 
And before she uh, came on here, she was telling me that uh, President Reagan and Congress have charged her office with the responsibility of looking to the future of the space program. Ms. Smith, thanks for coming in and joining us on such short notice. Your concern about the space program in view of this tragedy? I'm not sure it's fair to say that I'm concerned about the space program. I'm greatly hopeful that the space program will continue on very vigorously. But obviously this is a terrible tragedy and I just hope that NASA is able to determine with certainty exactly what went wrong so that it can make sure it never happens again. Tell us more about your office and your charge. The commission was established by Congress and the President about a year and a half ago to look at the long-range future of the space program. There was a feeling that NASA was doing very well in the present with the shuttle flights, which have been going very well until today, but that they were not looking to the very long-term future, 20 years from now, for example. So we were set up to look at that and to establish recommendations for what to do in the long range. What are you recommending? The commission is still preparing the report and all the recommendations are not final. The chairman of the commission is Tom Payne, a former administrator of NASA, and he has said himself publicly that the, the overall thrust of the report is going to be opening up the inner solar system for science and exploration and development. And of course, there is a very strong manned component of that. So we certainly hope that this will not affect the manned program in the long-term future, but I think we can certainly expect that it will be some time before we see another shuttle launch. When we do see another shuttle launch, and given the uh, projection that you cited with yourself and Mr. Payne looking into the future, uh, could one assume that there would be manned space flight even farther into space? Well, certainly in the very long-term future, that's what most people think about. They think of going back to the moon and establishing bases there of some sort, and then going on perhaps to Mars and establishing bases there for scientific exploration and for developing resources there that could send us out even further into the solar system. Are you really fearful that uh, notwithstanding NASA's exemplary uh, space record that uh, there might become a backlash to the program because of this tragedy? There's always that concern that didn't happen at the time of the Apollo fire in 1967 or at the near tragedy that we had with Apollo 13 and I have great confidence in the American people that they will not suddenly turn their back on the MAN program. The MAN program has given us many, many benefits throughout all of society, and I'm sure that it will continue to do so. Any idea of the magnitude of the tragedies that have befallen the Soviet space program? The Soviets have lost four cosmonauts in space-related accidents in 1967, just three months after the Apollo fire in which our three astronauts were killed. The first pilot of the Soyuz 1 spacecraft, Vladimir Komarov, was killed. And then in 1971, three more cosmonauts were killed in the Soyuz 11 accident when the atmosphere inside their spacecraft cabin depressurized during reentry and they were asphyxiated. So they've had a total of four who died in space flights. Is it generally universal in uh, space program circles, as Senator John Glenn said, he believes personally that everyone realized that at some point something like this had to happen. Is that uh, generally accepted as a possibility? As horrible as it sounds, yes, I think it is generally accepted that sooner or later there was going to be a tragedy and a crew would be lost. I don't think any of us thought it would be this soon. And whenever it happened, it would have been just as horrible. And just to be sure we get your full thoughts on this, why? Why the acceptance of that? Simply because this is a very risky enterprise. It's the same reason that we accept the fact that there are going to be airplane crashes, but we take airplanes nevertheless. We accept that there will be automobile crashes, but we drive automobiles nonetheless. It's a risky business. And finally, one last question uh, to ask of you. Will this tragedy affect the Commission's report? What does it do, first of all, and, and how will this tragedy have an effect if indeed it will, on the Commission's report. Well, it truly is too early to tell. We are in the midst of writing our recommendations right now, and the plan had been to give the report to the President around April 11th. We were timing that because it's a Friday, and the 12th, which regrettably is a Saturday, is the fifth anniversary of the first shuttle launch. I would not be surprised if our own deliberations were stretched out because one of our most uh, vocal members of the Commission is astronaut Kathy Sullivan, and I'm quite certain that for the next few weeks at least she will not be able to participate in our deliberations because she'll be busy helping NASA find out what went wrong. So I would not be surprised if, if our report slipped, but perhaps we can still get it in on schedule.
Marcia Smith, Executive Director of the National Commission on Space. Thank you. Thank you. Now to Lou Waters in Atlanta. All right, Bernie, millions of Americans were watching the uh, liftoff of the shuttle Challenger this morning, including those intimately involved with the manned spaceflight program. We've heard uh, the reaction from the Kennedy Space Center, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Andrew Holtz tells us the reaction from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena this morning. We have at this time. Almost everyone at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory watched the launch and saw the explosion. Groups of workers and reporters stood around monitors waiting for word about the cause of the failure. Some members of the press corps were near tears, even as they speculated about what happened. Stand one. Foreign correspondents spread the unhappy news around the world. NASA JPL employees offered each other sympathy. But mostly, the people here stood silently, in shock. A Voyager press briefing was scheduled to follow the shuttle launch. It was to be the culmination of the week-long Uranus encounter, a day for congratulations on a mission of space exploration well done. But all that vanished in the explosion of Challenger. Andrew Holtz, CNN, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. If we were to put a face on this shuttle flight, it would be that of Sharon Krista McCulloch. 37 years old. She was one of the seven crew members aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger this morning when it exploded. We have a profile from CNN's Carol Buckland, who starts with the moment McAuliffe stepped into the spotlight of a massive NASA talent search. Chris McAuliffe from Concord, New Hampshire. Um, one of the things that I would like to do when I go aboard the shuttle is to bring back the wonder of it all. Those were Krista McAuliffe's words when she was introduced to the press last July 1st as one of the 10 finalists in the Teacher in Space program. She was one of more than 11,000 teachers who'd applied for the honor. She told NASA she wanted to demystify spaceflight and to humanize the technology of the space age. And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Where is that you? <laughs> Less than three weeks later, this then 36-year-old high school social studies teacher was tapped to become the first average citizen in space. It was an emotional moment. When that shuttle goes, there might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. That's great. Her husband, Steve, and nine-year-old son, Scott, and six-year-old daughter, Carolyn, received the news with understandable pride. So, it seemed, did her whole hometown of Concord, New Hampshire. But beyond the hoopla of being an instant celebrity, McGullip was faced with the demands of being an astronaut in training. Despite a few joking complaints about the close quarters on the shuttle, she said it was like putting six people in a pup tent, she clearly relished the challenge. She also devoted a great deal of time to what were to have been two live televised lessons from space. The first of those, which was to have given school children around the country a glimpse of daily shuttle life, had been billed as the ultimate field trip. In an interview shortly before her tragic death, McAuliffe reflected on what she was doing. She said she hoped to inspire others to reach out and try new and different things. That message can get back to kids and to anybody, that, you know, to go for it. You know, to go ahead and push for something. Maybe that, you don't know whether you're going to attain it. I had no idea I was ever going to be chosen. But I felt good because I reached out for that. Television can be very wrenching at a time such as this. Ms. McAuliffe, now let's go to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tip O'Neill. And the Minority Leader of the House, it allows us to express our sentiments in this day of sorrow. The gentleman from California. Speaker, I yield to the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Hayes, one minute. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, needless to say, I rise in support of the resolution. I didn't personally know any of the seven people involved in the flight, except as human beings. I'd like to raise the obvious question which has been trickling around in my mind as I hear the speeches here. Is it worth it? 
Is it worth it? Some have already answered this question as they mourn for the families and express sympathy. And as we lament over the next few days and try to find out of the few weeks what caused it, I just hope as we pray and talk to the Lord God Almighty that we ask him for guidance and give us a sense of direction so that we might determine our purpose for space exploration. I hope our motivation is something more than just trying to keep pace with the Soviet Union. We do it based on a determination and decision as to what it's going to do to help mankind. I couldn't help but listen at the amount of money that went down with these lives of seven people. $3.2 billion for one spaceship. And how many people who are hungry today that might be helped if we decide to continue? We must understand. And I have not made a decision as to whether or not we should, we should continue or not. I want guidance as to whether or not we go in the right direction. But I think we ought to be able to understand and be motivated for other purposes other than just keep pace with somebody else at the expense and risk of lives. Robots may be used for this purpose. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. Certainly we've had success, and I don't want to ignore it. But I just want us to think and think deeply and pray over this situation and ask the good Lord to give us a sense of direction as to where to go from here. All time is expired. Yeah. Speaker, uh, I yield to the gentleman from uh, Texas uh, one minute. Yeah. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Speaker and my colleagues, uh, I join the rest of my colleagues today on behalf of my constituency to extend uh, the previous our speaker, Charles Hayes families. of Illinois, indicating some of the soul searching that has already begun in Congress. Each member of the House of Representatives, virtually each, those who are on Capitol Hill right now, each is taking a turn to come up and express himself, herself publicly. And we got in at the end of House Speaker Tip O'Neill's remarks. We're going to be replaying those for you, but we wanted to uh, see and hear the report on uh, Ms. McAuliffe. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. <laughs> Go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Out. <laughs>
Joining me now here in Atlanta is Carol Hickson, uh, who is affiliated with the Fernbank Science Center. Uh, Center. It's part of the DeKalb County uh, school system in suburban Atlanta. Carol was uh, one of the finalists in the Teacher in Space project. You sat down beside me uh, just a few minutes ago as we were uh, playing the Krista McCullough uh, piece where she was talking about going for it, her enthusiastic spirit. You clearly had some emotion on your face at that time. What are you feeling today? Well, I think, like the rest of the world, devastation at this terrible tragedy, but you nailed Krista's personality exactly when you said enthusiasm, and I hope that this tragedy will not dampen that enthusiasm for space exploration and, and continuing this pioneer and preparing our students for the lives that they will have the opportunity to experience. So you would not agree with uh, Representative Charles Gray, who we heard speaking from the floor of the House of Representatives a few minutes ago, that maybe we should look into using robots or some unmanned space uh, program now. No, I, I think this will certainly take some looking into and, and prevention from anything like that happening in the future, but it is a program in its infancy and it is a pioneer science and I think that it is a step to the future and there are things that simply cannot be done and accomplished by robots and certainly not the spirit of the program. Now the teacher in space program was an idea hatched by the President of the United States this morning's tragedy will certainly now delay the space shuttle program for an indefinite period of time until at least it can be determined what caused this morning's crash. What are your feelings about the Teacher in Space project and what's been lost and what might be recouped? On well, I think certainly the loss is, is the personnel, but the program itself is still very viable. I was at a conference all of last week with the other finalists and we refer to ourselves as the class of 51L and most of the thrust of that conference was how to continue bringing education in the space program not only to our students and communities but um, to the public in general. I think there will be a slowdown until they do discover what caused these uh, mishaps but I'm very positive about the program itself. What will you tell your uh, students? What would you tell students who may be watching you now? Uh, we've had nothing but triumph after triumph after triumph with the space program. Uh, we have uh, young children emulating astronauts. We have the astronaut toys. It's sort of part of our society now. This tragedy, what effect will that have on your students and other students? Well, again, I, th I think there may be a slowdown as far as NASA meeting its scheduled 15 launches for the year, but I don't think the enthusiasm of the youth of the nation will be dampened by it. it it's um, like we recouped after the, the tragedy in 67. Um, it is very emotional, and this was simply the first step in the citizen in space program. A teacher was selected because of the communication skills, but right now the competition is underway for a journalist and the, the citizen in space program is the um, thrust of that particular part of nasa and bringing the program to the general public and people that are not quote astronauts but that can relay the spirit of the program to the general public if you had it to do all over again knowing what you know about today the uh, the tragedy of the challenger flight would you uh go for the teacher in space I certainly project. would. I definitely would. And uh, from here on out, do you have a, are you intimately involved with this? I notice you're wearing uh, your space pin there. Uh, right. Once you get involved, I know from covering uh, NASA uh, missions from Houston in the past, you sort of get caught up you do. in this thing. You do. I have been in aerospace education for about 15 years and it's it's addictive and um, this was certainly a program that brought it to the forefront to other educators and um, to the public in general and, and no, it, I don't think it will slow down that effort um, but it will certainly have a bittersweet application at this point. Senator John Glenn said this morning that it had to happen, it was an inevitability that sooner or later a a crew would be lost, and that has been substantiated by other uh, guests we've had on uh, CNN throughout the morning and early afternoon. Uh, does, uh, wh what is your reaction to that? Well, I, when I applied, I, I heard that same thing, you know, that it's really a new system of transportation. You know something will happen someday, but 
Um, they, I did, did, they did warn you? Well, not, you? not NASA in particular, but just people. You right. know, saying when you say I've applied for this position, but um, I mean, it's sort of like taking a trip. You know, there's always that risk, and I think NASA is very thorough, and I, I believe they're meticulous in details, and they hold and hold and hold until they think it's perfect, and I feel it's as safe as any other mode of transportation, and certainly worth the effort to learn what we can as far as working and using space in a beneficial way for all of mankind. I know you were upset by all of this today. We appreciate you taking the time Thank to come you so in much and for having share your me. thoughts with us. Carol Hickson of the Fernbank Science Center here in Atlanta. Uh, she was one of the finalists uh, from here in Georgia in the Teacher in Space program. This was the second flight for the uh, mission specialist Ellison Unizuka, he became an astronaut, as we mentioned before, in 1978, part of a large class of astronauts in that year. In an interview taped last month, Ellison was asked how this flight would differ from his previous flight. This flight is, is a lot different. There's a lot, the activities are different. The events are different. Uh, uh, this flight in itself, uh, for me, creates as much enthusiasm as I had on the first flight. Uh, uh, in fact, even more because there is so much more to get done. Um, what, what are you looking forward to this time? That maybe you didn't have well, time last time. You know, I, I would be lying to you if I told you that I didn't look out the window on the last flight. But uh, certainly uh, there are many things that, that you wish you had done more of. Uh, and I'm looking forward to going back. Uh, I hope to be looking out the window a little bit more. Uh, uh, there are some things that that I remember doing that uh, that I never stopped to to think about a little bit, and uh, you know, as far as uh, you know, the Earth observations were concerned. Uh, uh, this time we'll be looking at the stars some, um, and uh, I'm very anxious because of the fact that uh, uh, these are things that that I wanted to do more of. Uh, this time I understand them better. I I know what I'm looking for. Uh, at least I hope I know what I'm looking for. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's going to be a lot more interesting because it's not just looking out the window. This time uh, I'm look, looking for specific sites. I'm looking for specific stars. Uh, I'm going to be looking for that comet. Uh, it's, Everybody's uh, going to be pushing each other out of the way for the window? I'm sure, uh, you know, the, the window time is going to be, a, you know, something that will come at a premium price. <laughs> That was Colonel Ellison Onizuka, a native who was a native of Hawaii. Jarvis worked for Hughes Aircraft and was a payload laser specialist aboard Challenger this morning. He said he never thought he would go into space, never thought he would be an astronaut. Craig, did you ever think that you'd be going in space? Not in the slightest. Uh, it was kind of, you, you, you kind of look at the, the John Youngs of the world and you say, gee, that was a... It's a great opportunity. You kind of say, "Well, I'm not gonna worry about that. I've got my career." And uh, so this one touched me about uh, well, a year and a half ago. They, with the uh, advent of the payload specialist program, they Hughes uh, NASA offered Hughes the opportunity to fly a couple of their uh, employees uh, along with the LESAT. And so I uh, applied at the 11th hour and was uh, fortunate enough to get selected. Yeah, but that's the kind <clears> of thing you you've always been kind of you know around the space program. <clears throat> but you've never been able uh, until right now. I mean, you just grab a hold and... Well, it's been very satisfying because you are close to the space. You you don't get to do the ultimate trip, but you're close enough to the program that you really feel like you're contributing and you, you bring your friends in to see the spacecraft and they look at it and you say, gee, I wonder, you know, maybe it is something special because I spent all my life around it, so it becomes very mundane to me. But again, you know, if you aren't, if you aren't around those kind of things, uh, I'm gee whiz about other things, so it's kind of... How in the world yeah. could a space shuttle be mundane. <laughs> no, the, in terms of spacecraft, yeah. because you work with them. Well, yeah. Even for the people who are around them, uh, they see them day in. You know, the trip is not mundane, but the shuttle itself is, it's a piece of machinery that people put together, well, like people like you and I put together. They've got different trades. Uh, some of them are skilled mechanics, some of them are, are software guys, but they're all, they're just like you and I, only have a different bent. Do, do you think of yourself as an astronaut? Because I, I, there are certain visions, I think, that we have when we think of an, an astronaut. Is, is that you? Uh, let's see. When I first was uh, down here, I said, gee, I don't belong here. And uh, after a while, I said, you know, maybe I do belong here. It's, uh, 
it, uh, I, I felt good about myself. Uh, I felt comfortable. I felt like I belonged. And, you know, you get, you, after a while, you get, you, the, the first time you put on the blue flight suit, you, you say, you kind of walk around, well, maybe I'll let them walk in front of me and they won't see me. But after a while, you, th you think you, 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 you do the things that they do, you, uh, you work around the, the, the orbiter. You say, I know what I'm doing here. I, I belong. Well, <clears throat> if you're just joining us, uh, We've been uh, covering this story since this tragedy developed this morning in our live coverage of the actual space launch and the disaster that occurred shortly after liftoff. At the White House this afternoon, President Reagan had invited uh, reporters and network anchormen to a background briefing on his uh, State of the Union address. As you know, that address has been moved back for a week now because of this tragedy. And the president was in his office being prepared by his senior staff for his meeting with us. And uh, Mr. Reagan was informed by Vice President Bush and National Security Advisor Admiral John Poindexter that this tragedy had occurred. He immediately left the Oval Office and went into a study and turned on the television set where he became more informed on what was happening. The reaction throughout this federal city has been very sad indeed. Up on Capitol Hill, members of the House of Representatives and the United States Senate have been expressing themselves. And just a short while ago, House Speaker Tip O'Neill appeared in the well of the House. Today, our shock turns to sadness. We salute those who risked and gave their lives to serve our country at the last great frontiers. We salute those who died performing ex exploits that the people of my age grew up reading about in comic books or in fiction. That was House Speaker Tip O'Neill on the floor of the House a short while ago. As we said, uh, we went to him and he had just finished his remarks. We wanted to continue listening to that uh, report that we had on Krista McAuliffe. We told you, if you're coming back to us wondering where the NASA people are, we had been told that they were going to speak at 3.30 Eastern time this afternoon from Washington, and then NASA indicated that they wanted to move it back, so we're told now that uh, the news conference, the news briefing from NASA with the latest on this tragedy will now come at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Now, let's go back to Lou Dobbs in Atlanta. Lou Waters, Bernie, and... Uh it happened at 11.39 this morning, approximately a minute, minute and 15 seconds. We're getting some discrepancy on the exact time after liftoff that the worst tragedy in the history of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration happened, the first in-flight disaster in 56 U.S. manned space missions. CNN's Mike Cavanaugh recalls the tragedy. We have main it had become as routine as four, the delays, three, a shuttle on the launch two, pad. One, Countdown. And Blast off. off. Time and time again, the shuttle had gone off, leaving behind a stunning trail of smoke and fire. This time was different. This time, as eyes followed it on its way to the heavens, something went wrong. Three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity, 2,257 feet per second. Altitude, 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. At first, it was thought it was just the booster rocket separating from the craft. But a closer look showed it was indeed the entire space plane that had become a cloud of smoke. Mission control said debris fell several miles in the Atlantic. Recovery forces sped to the rescue, but NASA conceded there was probably no human life to retrieve. The seven-member crew had waited since Sunday for this mission. Among the astronauts, schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe from New Hampshire, specially picked and specially trained for the much-envied ride into space. Her parents watched from the VIP site not far away. They hugged and sobbed. Anyone who watched was moved.
In Washington, the House paused for a minute of silence. President Reagan was tuned into the launch. Just like everyone else, he expected a success. Quite frankly, the president was stood there in almost stunned silence as he watched the television. Uh, you, could, uh, you could certainly read uh, the concern, uh, the sorrow, uh, the anxiety uh, on his face as he watched uh, and the group watched around him. As I say, he was, he was virtually watched in silence. 55 manned space missions had made it without an in-flight disaster. The 56 was not so lucky. Mike Cavanaugh, CNN. Senator John Glenn became a national hero in 1962 when he became the first American to orbit the Earth. Of today's tragedy, Senator Glenn said such a space disaster was bound to happen. Well, I think any, uh, I think everyone that's ever had any connection with the program has felt that, that someday there would be a, a loss in flight. Uh, we're dealing with tremendous powers and speeds. You're traveling in orbit at five miles a second and trying to get back into the atmosphere from that kind of speed. And so uh, are we going to be perfect forever? I guess the answer was proven this morning that the answer to that is no. But Republican Senator Jake Garn says safety is NASA's foremost concern. Garn was the first U.S. senator in space. He blasted off on the shuttle Discovery last April. No, I was down on Saturday and for the launch on Sunday morning, and they were criticized on Sunday for being overly careful. Safety has always been uh, foremost in their minds. And we woke up on Sunday morning after having canceled at 10 o'clock the night before to a perfect morning. <clears throat> it was beautiful, sunny, clear blue skies, perfect launch, and there was a lot of talk that rather irritated me Well, NASA was overly cautious. And so, no, I don't think that's true at all. As I mentioned, this is the worst disaster in NASA history, but it's not the first. CNN's Bill McGowan has a report. Tragedy struck once before in the U.S. space program. In 1967, three astronauts were killed when fire swept through their Apollo spacecraft as it was being tested on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. The deaths of Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chafee are the only fatalities on board a spacecraft in the U.S. space program. That fire apparently started when an electrical spark ignited the oxygen-rich atmosphere in the spacecraft. The tragedy delayed the Apollo program for nearly two years while safety features were added. The Soviets were first in space with Sputnik in 1957 and first with a man in space with Yuri Gagarin's 1961 Earth orbit. They, too, have paid a cost in human life. A cosmonaut was killed during a 1967 space flight when the craft's parachute failed to open on returning to Earth. In 1971, three Soviet cosmonauts were found dead in their return spacecraft after 24 days in orbit. Despite spectacular achievements like landing men on the moon, America's space effort has been plagued with technical problems from its earliest days. The space shuttle program has had its share of technical troubles. The shuttle Challenger has had earlier flights aborted because of fuel contamination, and one of its missions was cut short when an engine shut down in flight. The frequent launch postponements underline NASA's concern for safety factors, but today's tragedy emphasizes that Human ingenuity cannot eliminate the element of danger from the exploration of space. Bill McGowan, CNN. We are just now beginning to get reaction from overseas. CNN's Richard Blystone has a report on that from London. Chosen from the elite of British flyers, they were to have flown to Houston later this week to start intensive astronaut training. Squadron leader Nigel Wood was to be payload specialist for the launch of a British military communications satellite from the shuttle Columbia in June. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Faramond is his backup man. The gap left by the disaster focuses on the European competitor to the shuttles in satellite launching, the Ariane rocket. Despite an Ariane blow-up last fall, it now stands a better chance of wooing British business. But right now we can say that certainly the flight of the orbiter will be grounded for a long period. And uh, as far as I'm as in concern, we shall try to help the space community to fulfill the 
of the best possible the engagement. A spokesman for the Ariane Consortium said, we share this catastrophe with our American friends. The Europeans have learned a lot from the Americans, the spokesman said, including that the smallest thing can cause an accident. Here is how Soviet viewers learned of the disaster in a country that knows about mourning spacemen. At least four Russian cosmonauts have died on missions. Vladimir Komarov in 1967 and in 1971 the three-man crew of a Soyuz capsule. And I'm reminded tonight of those words of Werner von Braun um, 19 years ago yesterday at the uh, Apollo fire when he reminded us all he said the public view of this is that you get a bunch of guys train them up as astronauts, light the blue touch paper, they come back, you've got a bunch of heroes. It just reminds us all that we're not in the business of making shoes. This is the message from the British astronauts. We are greatly saddened by the tragic loss of life at Kennedy Space Center, and the deepest sympathy is extended to the wives and families of the shuttle crew. Simple language and matter of fact, typical of the kind of people who risk their lives in space. Richard Blystone, CNN London. President Reagan, deeply shocked and concerned over what happened today. The president was preparing to discuss his planned State of the Union message with reporters, including this one today. Instead, his national security advisor came in with the news, along with Vice President Bush. Soon after, President Reagan decided to postpone delivering that message tonight. He'll do that next Tuesday instead. Tonight, President Reagan will address the nation on the Challenger tragedy. White House spokesman Larry Speaks says it's too early to speculate about the impact of this explosion and the deaths on the space program itself. The president said, and I quote, these people were dedicated to the exploration of space. We could do no more to honor them, these courageous Americans, than to go forward with the program. As we indicated, Vice President George Bush was at the White House when the shuttle exploded this morning. After a meeting on Capitol Hill, the vice president told reporters how he and the president reacted. Obviously, expressed his concern, shock, but that was all happened very fast. He went in, I went back down to my office, then I went in afterward before I came up here and chatted with him, and he was watching some of the replay. But it was, you know, concern for the families. That's, the, that's his motivation and certainly mine. Vice President Bush at this moment now on his way to Cape Canaveral, Florida to express his concern directly to the astronauts' families. Members of Congress today expressed their shock and dismay at this tragic shuttle accident, but they vowed that the tragedy would not stop America's space program. As long as man has the thirst for knowledge, we will continue to press outward. And in the process, there is risk that risk is taken by each one of us every day. And that risk is understood by all the members of a crew that climb into a loaded spaceship. We know that the men and women who have carried us on to the space frontier are people of great strength of character who are willing to face the dangers involved in the space program so that our future and the future of our children and their children may be assured. The rewards to mankind and this nation that exist on that frontier are believed by each of them to be worth the risks. We have grown to take for granted uh, enormous uh, technical events such as this, and uh, we have grown to uh, assume that nothing will ever happen, and we had hoped this one would never happen, but it did. I'm hopeful that it doesn't. Uh, totally dampen our spirit and enthusiasm for uh, experimental things and for outer space activities because they uh, are absolutely necessary. This is a day of sadness that we will never forget. We will, however, Mr. Speaker, go on with our space program. We will pursue our dream to live and work in space, to push back the limits of our knowledge in the vast sea of space. But wherever we go, we will carry in our hearts the memory of those courageous men and women who died today so suddenly and so unexpectedly. God bless them and their families in this tragic hour. And of course, in watching our live coverage, you know that there is not full unanimity on the continuation of the space program, the wisdom thereof. Charles Hayes, Democrat from Illinois, indicated that it is time to pray for guidance, to pray for those who died today, 
and he wondered aloud whether or not, for example, robots might not be used. The House of Representatives says it will conduct a complete investigation of the accident after NASA finishes its report. The next major event in about nine minutes will be a briefing from uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration from the Kennedy Space Center, uh, where offshore the uh, recovery efforts are continuing. The last information we received from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Nicholson was that floating debris has been turned up. We know no more than that. We hope to learn more in about eight and a half or nine minutes when NASA briefs us from Cape Canaveral. Joining us now in San Francisco, Dr. Carol Rosen, who is president for the Institute for Security and Cooperation in Outer Space. That is a group determined to find and pursue peaceful enterprises in space. Dr. Rosen is opposed to the president's proposed space defense initiative. We know now, uh, Dr. Rosen, that it perhaps will be several months before the uh, space shuttle program will be again revived pending an investigation of today's tragedy. What, what does that mean to you? Well, I think this gives us a very important and tragic pause in history, but one in which we can now further analyze and really consider how we're going to be developing the space frontier. These are the pioneers, these are the heroes today who were so tragically killed, but they knew the risks involved in pioneering this new frontier and there are many of us who are concerned about how we evolve into space. Now the focus and attention has been brought to space in a most unusual way. We see both the tragedy and the opportunities that are going to be made available to us as the result of fernal further analysis of the situation. And I think now it's going to bring even more to the intention, especially of the American public, the fact that the Strategic Defense Initiative is based upon this high-tech, computerized technology, which is not flawless, and that putting us on a one-second hair-trigger decision-making time based upon such computers as to whether to determine from a satellite computer whether a launch is an enemy launch or not and fire or not is a very, very high risk, and why should we be researching this kind of weapon system or defensive system, as it's called, that wouldn't protect anyone? And why don't we now put in our full attention to tuning in our minds and to further fine-tuning our technologies so that as we evolve into this frontier, fewer and fewer tragic accidents will happen and more and more opportunities will be provided. You said this is an important uh, pause uh, for the uh, space program. Are you not concerned about the advances being made in, in medicine and the like? This may uh, uh, irreparably harm certain phases of the space shuttle program. I don't believe that it will irreparably harm any phases of the space program. In fact, I think it can only enhance in an odd sort of way what we're doing. We now know that we have life at stake and this kind of explosion can happen at any moment based upon the nuclear weapons that we have on Earth by any number of other tragic events that could happen from epidemics to water problems to health problems. And we now see the instantaneousness of life itself. And the space program represents higher technology and higher consciousness. With this event now that happened today, we have a pause to see how space technology and its applications can be advanced and we can focus now on how we can apply this technology to solving problems of earth to creating more jobs uh, profits if people are interested which is hard to talk about under these sensitive circumstances a new kind of security system that in fact is based on cooperative technology this also shows me that this is a time when we need to be pulling our resources with the rest of the world who are also moving into this space area so that we can find out what kinds of problems other people are experiencing around the world and what kinds of solutions they're finding. And space gives us this opportunity. This unfortunate event makes it possible now for all of us to see that this is the time in history that we need to redirect all of the funding and resources available to us to developing this frontier, to 
converting the Earth's weapons industry into a space industry and other industries without weapons in it, to enhancing this kind of technology, especially the computers, communication, and information that we're being, that's going to be made available to us as a result of this analysis. Right. And about the time that we have right now to apply ourselves to evolu evolving into space peacefully, cooperatively, and to recognizing these pioneers as heroes. All right, Dr. Rosa, we thank you so much for uh, stopping by to share your thoughts with us. We're going to have to jump now to uh, Stuart Lurie, who's on the line from Osco with a uh, reaction to today's tragedy at the Kennedy Space Center. Stuart. Well, first of all, I don't think that there is going to be any gloating over this in the Soviet Union. Uh, this accident occurred after working hours here, but I have already received a telephone call from a friend of mine in Tbilisi, the capital of Soviet Georgia, many thousands of miles away. And he called because he had heard of this on Soviet television, and he wanted to express his sympathies to me and to the American people. The Soviet people learned very quickly of the disaster. TASS, the official news agency, reported the tragedy a half hour after it happened. And then the main evening news show, Vrania, showed the liftoff and the explosion less than two hours after it happened. And the narrator used very grave tones, the kind of tones that they usually reserve respectfully for obituaries of important officials here. He told his viewers that there are practically no chances that any of the crew members survive. He pointed out that the shuttle had no ejection systems for his crew. He also talked about the mission of the Challenger, uh, to place a communication satellite into orbit and also instruments to observe Halley's Comet. Uh, the Soviets have an unmanned spacecraft, two of them in fact, that will be flying by Halley's Comet in early March and taking photographs of it. All right, Stuart, uh, we want to uh, move along. We're expecting in a matter of moments from the Kennedy Space Center a briefing by NASA. We want to tell you about the explosion of the shuttle Challenger which happened just a minute or so uh, into its launch, 72 seconds after launch, to be precise. We're going to take a look now at a routine shuttle launch of the shuttle Atlantis last October and have that compared to today's tragic launch of Challenger. Engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. We have no down 